Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahedo Bible Study Podcast. As always, let me remind you at the top of the three S's, subscribe, share, and support. Subscribe wherever you find this, be it YouTube, Transistor, Anchor, Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever. Share the link that you found this on with others and share the very words of God that you hear recited or read aloud. And finally, support at patreon.com slash tawahado. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash tawahado. T-e-w-a-h-i-d-o. You can also subscribe to the newsletter at aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M dot substack dot com. Today we are in Apocalypse or Revelation or Uncovering, Chapter 3. There are three main churches which are addressed here. The Church of Sardis, the Church of Philadelphia, and the Church of Laodicea. The Church of Sardis, I couldn't find anything on what Sardis means, but it was the capital of Lydia, so one of those places in Asia. Philadelphia is interesting because we have a Philadelphia in the United States, and everybody knows that Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. You know, you see that Phil, the same Phil that is in uh, Philokalia, that is in philosophy, that is in uh, file. When you hear something blank, Francophile, Anglophile, Japanophile, that file, that PH, which represents the F sound, IL, uh, stands for love and the Delphia is the brother. So the brotherly love, the city of brotherly love, and this is the church of brotherly love. So Sardis uh, can have some adjustments. Philadelphia is doing good. They need to stay the same. And then we go to Laodicea. I again, couldn't find something specific on Laodicea, but especially in later parlance uh, affected, especially in the English language by the King James Bible, Laodicea and Laodiceans are considered lukewarm people. This is a very iconic phrase here uh, <laughs> that actually came across in a political reading from uh, a secular Jew. So it shows you that even secular Jews in the society are familiar with New Testament literature if they are fans of the Anglo-Saxon culture, which is to say English language literature. And uh, so it was very, it was very delightful when I, when I came across that. Whenever I see people using biblical language in non-biblical settings, whether for good or for bad, I appreciate it, and and it shows that the seed of God continues to be sown in multiple contexts, and that uh, His ministry is certainly not going to end with me. The living God uses everyone and can use anyone at any time and any place, including a jackass, let alone me. So. Without further ado, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. This is the portion addressing Sardis. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death. For I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Yet you have still a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my father and before his angels. Let anyone who has an ear to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So, as always, angels are messengers. Remember the functionality. See the distinction between being alive and being dead, being asleep and needing to wake up. It's very fascinating. This is common to the Isaiah language of lip service, right? These people try to get close to God with their lips and yet in their hearts, meaning in their thoughts, they are very distant from God. That is what it means to be a zombie. 
to appear as alive and yet be dead. So he tells them, you know, death is the cousin of sleep. So he then switches over to a sleeping analogy and says, wake up. We talk a lot about wokeness nowadays in regards to social justice, in regards to political correctness, in regards to various political agendas that at least begin with the common critique of police brutality. Where they end is another story, but they at least begin in the right place. In this context, he's saying, hear the word of God, obey the word of God, repent according to the word of God. It is a cycle of the word of God. And you do this because there is an unknown time, which is the second coming, which is the judgment by Jesus. Stay ready, be ready. There's a remnant among them, just like in the prophetic literature of the Hebrew Bible. There is a remnant among them that do not have tainted, that do not have adulterated, that do not have spoiled clothing. They have white clothing. We'll see later on in Revelation, the martyrs wear white. We saw in the Gospels, the angels wear white. We see in the Gizrite church, we have the Nat'ala or the Nazala, which is the white shawl to represent the martyrs and to represent the angels and to represent uniformity in submission to God. This also calls to mind for me the great parable of the wedding banquet or the wedding feast in the gospel according to Matthew chapter 22. I would encourage you for homework to go and read Matthew 22 verses 1 to 14. But uh, I'll just read you my favorite part. My favorite part is really just verse 12, but I have to give at least the context of 11 to 14. So I'll, I'll read 12 by itself, and then I'll go back and read 11 to 14. So verse 12, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. So here's 11 to 14. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend. How did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So it's great. You know, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, Revelation, chapter 3, they're on the same page. You need the right clothing. And that clothing is hearing, obeying, and repenting in accordance to the word of God. Verses 7 to 13. Remember, previously was Sardis, now we enter perfection with the church of brotherly love. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, and to the angel of the church in brotherly love, write, these are the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Look, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and are not, but are lying, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you, because you have kept my word of patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. If you conquer, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. You will never go out of it. I will write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. First, I mentioned this before, but the synagogue of Satan and the pseudo-Jews here is not to be taken away by people to create a kind of bugaboo of anti-Semitism. Uh, rather, if you reread Deuteronomy, if you reread Exodus, if you reread Jeremiah, you will understand what it means to have not only circumcised private parts, but circumcised lips and a circumcised heart that is thinking mechanism. And when you have a circumcised thought and when you have circumcised speech, that hopefully leads to circumcised actions. So anyone who claims to be Jewish, 
whose actions are not circumcised, whose speech is not circumcised, whose thoughts are not circumcised, and merely has uh, genitalia that is circumcised, is no Jew at all. That is all that is being said, and it is a call and a challenge to all people. It is not to slight an ethnic group. The great Father Laurent Cleanwork shows us that this uh, this passage here, especially with the key of David, is actually from the scroll of Isaiah, chapter 22, verse 22. It is a reminder that Jesus is the king of kings of the cosmos, of the universe, of space-time. He is the ruler par excellence. And so who cares on November 3rd, 2020, who will be POTUS? Because the POTUS uh, is merely the president of the United States. But there is not a president, but a king of the universe, the cosmos of space-time itself. And his name is Jesus. And he will judge all those who have ever lived and all those who have ever died and his judgment is coming soon so you better uh, say maranatha that is to say maranatha come soon O lord and if you are a philadelphian if you are a member of the church of brotherly love keep up the good work that you're doing conquer but do not conquer in the way of alexander the great do not conquer like the greco-romans rather conquer like the king of the city of peace that is Jerusalem, which is above the new Jerusalem, not the geographic Jerusalem, again, not anti-Semitic, but the new Jerusalem, the Jerusalem above the city of peace, not made with human hands, but only crafted by the creator. Let those who have ears to hear, hear and listen. Verses 14 to the end, are dedicated and devoted to the Laodiceans. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to speak spit you out of my mouth, for you say I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white robes to clothe you, and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you, and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear Listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. By the way, this has been a reading of the New Revised Standard Version. That is the NRSV. I told you this. Uh, there's so many iconic lines here. I'll get to it. Uh, first, though, let me begin with uh, the American, uh, the 20th century American journalist, Samuel Hopkins Adams, according to Merriam-Webster, says uh, this in comparison of uh, Presidents Theodore Roosevelt and Warren Harding. Theodore Roosevelt, he calls fiery and aggressive. Warren Harding, he calls the Timorous Laudition. And it's so great that the reason why he called him a Laudition is he was trying to call him a flip-flopper. He was trying to say he was mild. He was neither here nor there, that he held no real opinions, and that Theodore Roosevelt was at least in one direction. So anyway, I, I mentioned earlier, not by name, uh, but I'll mention by name now. I was reading some political writings by Curtis uh, Yarvin, right? He's writing uh, the Gray Mirror book right now on Substack, uh, same kind of resource that I'm using. And in it, he quotes this cold, hot, lukewarm passage by the Lord Jesus. And it's so great that he does it because he's not a religious guy at all. But it's an invitation for you to go read 
the book of Revelation and specifically chapter three, which you are doing with me right now. So in this iconic passage, you have to be either cold or hot. You cannot be in between. You cannot be lukewarm. Otherwise, you get spit out. You get vomited. He says, offer me gold. That is to say money. Offer me clothes. You know, there's salve. What do you need? You need, you need gold. You need clothes. You need salve. No, what you need, because these are just illustrations, these are just mashalim, these are misareoch. They're supposed to lead you to getting reproved by him. And he encourages you because he's not sitting down with you as an equal. He's sitting down with you as your senior, you being the junior, so that he could reprove you, so that he could admonish you, so that he could rebuke you, so that he can teach you how to do a 180 degree turn in your life because he does not hate you, but he loves you. Don't listen to society that tells you don't judge. You personally aren't the judge, but Jesus certainly judges. Jesus wants us to about face. He wants us to turn around and to face him. That iconic passage of him standing at the door and knocking is not a cute folk tale to tell your kids to ease them into their bed at night. Instead, it has his foreboding voice that is giving you the last opportunity and chance to repent before he comes again to judge all those who've ever lived and all those who've ever died. Glory to God for all things.